As Brian mentioned, I'm Chris Hogan. I'm the executive pastor here. Um, it's great to be with all of you this morning. Uh, if we haven't had a chance to meet, I would love to meet and connect with you after service. Um, I'm sure any one of the staff members would as well. Uh, for those of you online, thanks for joining us this morning. The, uh, about a month ago, my family and I had a chance uh, to return to Oregon, which is where we moved from about two and a half years ago. Spent some time just with friends and family, and then we took the last couple days and uh, we toured out to the coast and stayed in the coastal mountains overlooking the ocean. Um, for those of you who don't know, the ocean, it's like Lake Michigan, but bigger. <laughs> um, but so, so we're out there in peace and just enjoying our time. Um, the one thing we didn't take into account, though, was that we'd have to fly back, and what time we had to fly back. And that was, we had a flight at 7 a.m. out of Portland, which is just about two hours from the coast, which means we had to be in Portland at 5, so we had to leave the coast at 3. 3 in the morning is a little bit early. Um, but beyond early, it's dark. The coastal highway is beautiful. During the day, it's lit. You have trees coming over the roads. You get comfort in the bends and the curves, and you're looking for small animals, and you're just enjoying the wildlife and the beauty of nature and what God brings. But at 3 in the morning, it's not so much. It's more like this lit only by the stars above. And it's been two years since we had been there, probably three since we had tried to drive that drive at night, and I got in the car with my entire family at three in the morning, and I started down the highway, and I started to realize real quick that I had no idea what the road ahead had, in, had for me. And the speed limit's 55, and as I looked down, I was going 35. <laughs> and I was going, please, Lord, give me a car that will pass me and lead the way, because I can't do this, and i got to get to the airport, and I can't be late, and I'm driving, and I'm scraping the steering wheel, and slowly a car comes, and it comes behind me, and it comes really tight behind me. And he's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I just need you around me. And then I come to realize real quick, there are no passing lanes. So for the next couple miles, this guy's running right at my tail. So to make it worse, I can't see ahead of me, and all I see is blinding headlights behind me. Finally, I was like, if I just pull over, if I just get on this shoulder enough, maybe he'll feel comfortable enough to go around me, and sure enough, I pulled his shoulder, he goes, I tried to jump out behind him, and he just went. <laughs> and I was like, well, if he can go that fast, then I can do it too. That must mean it's safe. And so I accelerate, and I start to go 45, and I realized that was not a smart idea. So I slowed back down to 35, and I was like, okay, God, please send me another car. Somebody else who can light the path in front of me, because I really need to make it. And so... After about 10 minutes, another car comes, and, and I do the same thing. I pull over just a little bit, but I knew this time not to slow down too much because I needed to accelerate. And so they get around me, and I accelerate, and I keep up for him about two turns, and then he's gone. But I was like, okay, I can feel this, and now I'm 45, and I'm like watching the clock, and I'm like, how am I going to make it? And the greatest thing happened. As I'm looking ahead, the sun starts to rise in front of me. And the dark blackness of the sky starts to turn this little amber and blue haze. And slowly I can see. And, and then soon I can see everything. And I was like, I didn't need a car in front of me. I needed the light of day. And some miracle occurs, and we got to the airport at exactly 5 o'clock, two hours before our flight, just in time for us to get a two-hour delay. <laughs> so 
See, the darkness of night can be scary. And sometimes we live in that darkness and we think all we need is somebody to walk in front of us, somebody who's been there before, somebody who can guide us through the darkness. But the truth is, it isn't to guide through the darkness that we need, but the light of a God in front of us. And as we approach the verses today, Jesus reminds us of that. See, as Nate told us a couple weeks ago, we're in the middle of John where Jesus is standing and teaching at the Feast of the Tabernacles. And the Feast of the Tabernacles really served two purposes for the people. The first purpose that it served was to guide people to remember the fact that God provided for them in the wilderness. So they had to build these tents and stay in tents for seven days. To some of you, that sounds like fun. To me, I'd prefer a hotel. <laughs> right? But they're staying in these tents to be reminded that God provided when they had nothing. And the other half of it is to look forward to God's ultimate provision in the Messiah that's ahead. So they started the day, they started each day of the festival with a water ceremony, and they ended each day of the festival with lights, not just any lights. Four 75-foot-tall menorahs where each basket in that menorah held seven and a half gallons of oil. In the dead of night, you could see the temple from anywhere. And in the middle of this, in the middle of all of this light, Jesus stands in front of a group of people. And he reads these, and he says these words. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Let's pray together. Father, we ask for you to come before us today and make your presence known within us and prepare our hearts and minds to hear the words you have for us. Because we know, Lord, that it isn't the word of man that brings fruit and life, but the word of God. We pray thank you that no matter the day or age that your word is truth and a guiding light. I pray these things in your name. Amen. So part of this group of people that's surrounding Jesus in this moment is the Pharisees. He has an extended group with the Pharisees, and that's Jewish followers of Jesus, people who are kind of inquisitive and watching him, and even farther are people who are dedicated to Jesus, his disciples. So Jesus starts his message by really looking at the people closest to him in this moment, and that's the Pharisees. See, the Pharisees were looking towards a Messiah because they needed physical redemption. They wanted a Messiah. They envisioned a man who God would send who would lead them over their oppressors in Rome, who would make Israel a great nation so that they could be conquerors and look down on other people with greatness. And it's in these words that Jesus challenges well, who they believe the Messiah to be. And he starts off with a simple phrase of I am. To many of the other people, it would have been a quick reminder of what Jesus could be saying, but to the Pharisees, they knew exactly what he was saying in that moment because this phrase I am was one that had been passed down from generations. Because when Moses was on Mount Sinai in the dead of night, a bush started burning in front of him. 
a light appeared in the darkness. And it said, Moses, take off your shoes. You're in holy ground. And as Moses went up to him, to the burning bush, God spoke through the bush and said, Moses, you will be the beacon to my people Israel. You will bring them out of Egypt. You will guide them. And Moses said, who are you? Who am I supposed to say sent me? <laughs> In the bush, speaking through the bush, God looks at him and says, Moses, you just tell him I am sent you. I am is this, this fabulous statement. It's this understanding that God was before creation and he is after creation. There is no creator there is nothing that was before him, and there will be nothing after him because he is over everything. And so when Jesus looks at the Pharisees, he's saying, I am the light. This light that you're looking for, this hope that you're looking for, this Messiah that you're looking for, I am the bringer of that light. And he took it a point, because in the middle of all this, when they're supposed to be remembering what's happened in the wilderness, he brought them right back to what they were remembering. This idea that the light of God first shone to Moses, then came to the people in a pillar of light, and the Pharisees had forgotten what happened after that pillar of light and cloud. Because they looked at it and they said, well, that pillar of light that God used in the night... It guided the way for the people of Israel so they could keep traveling. And then during the day, that pillar turned into a cloud. And it protected the people of Israel from the Egyptians who were following them. And when the Israelites crossed the Red Sea, it stood behind them. So the Israelites couldn't, or the Egyptians couldn't tell what was happening. And the Pharisees were remembering this. And Jesus took it a step further because he called them to remember the fact of what happened afterwards. And that's where God went to Moses and said, I will dwell among my people. I will dwell among my people. Build me a tabernacle, a place where I can be. And so, as the Israelites built a tabernacle, that same pillar rested in the middle of the tabernacle. And the light sat in what they referred to as an eternal flame in the middle of that tabernacle. And it was there not to protect the people, not to give them authority over everyone, but so that God could sit in relationship with the people. So Jesus' statement, I am the light, is a challenge to the authority of the Pharisees and their understanding of who God is and what he's supposed to be. He's not there to give them a physical king, but to give them new relationship. Still, the Pharisees respond in a way that shows their physical mindset. Because they look at him and go, well, Moses, or Jesus, you testify for yourself. How do you do this? Because in Deuteronomy, the law of Moses tells us that in order to testify, you have to have two or three people. But here's where it gets interesting. Because Jesus takes them again back to the same place that they were supposed to be focused on in the Mount of Sinai. Because when God said to Moses that I am, I am, what he said is, nobody else can testify but me. Nobody created me. Nobody can judge me. Nobody can guide me. Nobody comes after me. Nobody's better than me. I testify for myself. 
And that's Jesus' response. I am the testifier. I'm the one who testifies. And if you don't like my testimony, ask my Father who sent me. And it's, it, it's funny because we're told then that the Pharisees respond in a way that is actually anti-law. Because they ask, well, where's your father? Well, if he's going to testify for you, where is he? The interesting thing is, with Mosaic law, at all costs, you would avoid the testimony of a family member because it was slanted. You can get all your family, they all say the same thing. You're all covered. Jesus' response here, though, tells both the who and the why of what he is. His response is, you don't know me. You have no idea where I've come from, and you have no idea where I'm going. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are true because I am not alone. I stand with my Father who sent me. In your own law, it's written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am the one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. It's interesting that, again, these same questions that they bring before Jesus are the questions that Moses brought before God at the Mount of Sinai. Because Moses said, God, yes, you're I am, but what if I go to them and I say, I am sent me, and they want proof. And in that moment, God says, okay, Moses, my name should be proof enough, but I will give you proof. Stick your hand in your cloak. Stick his hand in his cloak. And he says, pull it out. He pulls it out, and it's white and leprous and dead. And then God says, okay, Moses, now put it back. Puts it back in his cloak. He says, now pull it out again. And it's normal. And it's alive. He says, if they don't believe my words, they'll believe my miracles. And there's Jesus' next statement to them. He says, I am a reflection of my Father. Have you not seen what I've done? Have you not seen the miracles that have followed me to this point? See, it's fun. The nature of who we are is always reflective of where we came from. Right? My son, Kellen, is a reflection of me. Sometimes I'm more willing to accept that than others. Right? He stands like I do. He walks like I do. He's got my style and swagger. Look at that. He is intrigued by the same things I'm intrigued by. When was the last time you saw a kid at eight that really loved PowerPoint? This is, that's, truly, that's what this picture is. The eight-year-old Kellen playing PowerPoint. He also makes the same faces I make. Hmm. Unfortunately, he also got my golf game. <laughs> See, here's the thing. If you know me, and you meet Kellen, you're like, I know where you belong. If you know Kellen, you've talked to him, You've been around him at all, and I walk into a room, you're like, that's where it came from. Right? There's this inherent nature that transfers from the Father to the Son. And what Jesus is saying in this moment is all that I am comes from this nature that's been passed down from God. I sit in relationship with him so I continue to show you who he is. The funny thing is, this is probably the one thing that could have gotten him in the most trouble with the Pharisees. 
this understanding that he was connecting himself directly with God, he was referring to God as his father because he didn't do that. And then in this moment, John uses a term and phrase that he'll use a couple other times in his book. And he says, but they didn't arrest him because it wasn't his time. It wasn't his time. The beauty of this is John also uses this as a transition in what Jesus is speaking about and who he's speaking to. Because what we find is Jesus' next words are no longer about reflecting to the past, but they're looking to the here and now and then reflecting, reflecting right into the future. So he shifts away from directing his conversation to the Pharisees and he goes to this wider audience and he says to the people, where I'm going, you cannot come. But you will look but you're going to die from your sins. He names this darkness. No longer is he talking about the light. No longer is he saying, look to who God is. Look to where we've come from. He's saying, you rest in a darkness of sin that you can't overcome. You've been following me. Right? Most of these people had probably been following Jesus around. He's a great teacher. They're, be they're becoming better people. They're following his rules. Everything's looking good. They're like, this is a great rabbi. And Jesus looks at him and goes, you can't come with me anymore. What he's really telling them is, you can't overcome the darkness on your own. Only I can do that for you. But the people don't get it. Because they ask a question that, to me, is probably the, one of the funniest questions written in Scripture. So I enjoy the fact that John wrote this. The people's response to Jesus is, is he going to kill himself? Not, where's he going? Not, what is this sin death you're talking about? It's like, what, is he going to kill himself? This reminds me of his, I don't know if anybody's seen the, the SNL skit. There's a skit where they're singing, Don't Stop Believing, and you have Will Ferrell in the audience. And, and after each line, Will Ferrell's like, are they by themselves? Where's this train going? And the song just keeps going. And, oh, thank you for answering that. It's the people. They're so lost in like this minute piece of the message that they're not getting the entirety of it all. And Jesus continues to talk to them. And he's like, guys, you're following a car in the dead of night that knows not where it's going and it's probably traveling at too high of rate and you're in a bad position. Let me light the path in front of you. Jesus continues talking, and he says, I told you that you would die in your sins if you don't believe that I am he. You will indeed die in your sins. It's direct. In these moments, Jesus becomes very direct, but probably it's the most loving statement that he could have ever made to them. I've told you over and over, this is the truth. And he uses a statement, and I like to go on record right now, LeBron James was not the creator of this statement. LeBron James thinks he is him, he is not him. Right? These are Jesus' words. I am him. You've been looking... You lit this menorah, you're looking towards the future, and you're so blinded by what's in front of you because you're so stuck trying to figure out how to walk this path in the darkness that you miss the light walking alongside you. I am the answer to the prayer that you've been casting. 
So the catch is we have the same problem sometimes, right? Where God, can you just bring a car to come lead the way and then I'll be fine? God, this piece of my life is hard. I will give it to you, but let me run the rest of it. And Jesus says, but I'm him. I'm the one who, when you allow me to, I will light the entirety of it all. I will take the load. In this entirety, Jesus gives us the full gospel message. He says, I was here in the beginning. We showed the light to Moses. To free you. I was here to protect you and guide you in the wilderness, and I was here to live with you in the temple, and now I'm here to walk with you in life, only to a place where my death, my death and resurrection overcomes the one thing you can't, darkness. And so what we learn, though, in this passage is, is we as people still have to respond to that. And there's three different responses that we see in this passage. And the first we see is we see the Pharisees respond. And what's their response is they reject him. Right? They reject him. They ridicule him. They look at Jesus and they're like, this guy's kind of scrawny. It doesn't look like he's going to take it and put on armor and restore us. He's not talking like a guy who's going to go before the people of, of Rome and, and take charge and conquer. He's, he doesn't look like the guy or talk like the guy who's going to make us great again. He must not be him. He's, he's from Galilee, right? Does anything good come from Galilee? Right? We have that choice, and some of us live that life, and we say, God, I just need you to be this. I'll follow you around for a little bit. I'll question you, but I won't give in, because you're not exactly what I want you to be. The second thing we can do is we can, we can question him, right? That's what we see from the people, and sometimes they're not the smartest question, right? But questions create growth because the last question that the people asked was a brilliant question. They looked at Jesus and they asked the same question that Moses asked the burning bush. They said, who are you? And Jesus said, I've told you from the beginning. Everything I've said has been the same message. I am the light. I'm here to conquer. I'm here to set you free from this sin. The problem is sometimes we can get stuck in this question space. We can get stuck like the rest of these people who are following Jesus around. He's a great teacher. He's a rabbi. We learn a lot from him. I'm a great person. I make good choices. I feel good about myself. I'm resting in this little bit of sunshine but I have control. And as long as we do that, we're never going to fully feel the power of God's grace, his forgiveness, or his conquering over death and sin, right? The third thing we can do is the last thing that we're told, right? Verse 30. And many believed. Not just believed Jesus' words, but they believed in him. They followed him. They said, this guy's got something. I know what the darkness is like. I know where my doubt brings. I know where my hardship is. I know where my sin lies. I know there are things that I'm not willing to uncover yet but I'm willing to give them over and learn 
and grow and develop. And that's what he's saying. And something powerful happens when we do that. Because you know what happened to Moses when he spent that time with God? When he gave himself over and he believed in God? He went up to the mountain to get that second set of Ten Commandments. And when he came back down, he scared people. Do you know why he scared people? Moses glowed. Glowed because he'd been in the presence of God. So much so that when he talked to the people, they made him put a veil on his face. And every time he went into the tabernacle to meet with God, he glowed. And the people made him put a veil over his face. Because when you live in that freedom, when you live in giving it over to God, when you're willing to accept who he is and submit to who he is, You live in the light. Right? First words out of Jesus' mouth to the Pharisees. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but live in the light of life. And this light is so powerful. Because Jesus himself tells us in Matthew 4, or Matthew 5, he says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. It doesn't light for you. It gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. The light of God is redemptive. The light of God overcomes darkness. Right? Jesus says something here to the people. He says, I offer to you light in the darkness. Not just to everybody either. Right? Jesus offers you light in your darkness. The choice becomes yours. How do you handle that light? Do you rest in it? Do you grow in it? Do you ask the questions? What a powerful statement to know that what we couldn't accomplish on our own, God has done for us. Let's pray. Father, um, you, you had a plan that was greater than all that we could imagine, and still we lose sight of it. It's so easy to be stuck in who we are and what we're doing, um, looking for the next person to hold our hand instead of the light to guide our path. And I just pray, Lord, that you may open our hearts and minds today, that you may cast a vision forward that lights the path, that as individuals, as a church, and as a community, we can become the beacon on the hill, Lord, not lit by four giant menorahs in oil that goes out, but lit by you, lit by the gift of your Son who redeems, the gift of your Son who overcomes all darkness, Lord. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen.